what's up giants fans hub watchers youtube subscribers twitter and instagram followers it's your boy aka kush back at it again with another episode of the now named it was nameless before but now the now named fantastic giants hosted by me kush and dan from five wide football you guys by now know dan i've appeared on his channel several times he's already been on my channel several times both the times we've been on each other's channels it's for this uh new series this new podcast whatever you want to call it you know we talk giants we talk nfl general ongoings and eventually we're gonna get into fantasy football when it builds up you know later on during the uh summer and fall gonna get into it uh hence the name fantastic giants so welcome back dan how you been man how's everything uh it's going good kush it's going good uh, i just wanted to thank all my fans who are here listening to this people have been following me on twitter or checking out my blog um i haven't posted anything in a couple of weeks been kind of busy with some family stuff that should be changing next week uh but for the time being probably my only uh youtube videos uh for the foreseeable future will just be here with kush and i'm gonna just primarily try to spit out some articles uh, until some family stuff uh blows over and things get a little bit less hectic yeah man you know you take your time with that real life is always better to prioritize than what we do on the internet i mean i was i was telling him man just take just take your time don't rush anything hopefully you know everything gets better and as dan said articles in case you guys don't know you know you're new to the series and whatnot make sure you not only subscribe to five wide football on youtube follow them on twitter which is uh you know it's not only ran by dan that kind of rhymed ran by dan <laughs> uh it's not only run by him you know it's uh there, it's basically a team of guys over there you know a group of friends that run it mostly fantasy football stuff you're gonna get a lot of good information out there and of course their blog as he talked about articles where I'll, basically everything they post is going to be so check out all of those will be in the link below thank you kush thanks no problem uh, and now so it, the news has been dry my guy it's uh let, let's not try and uh spoof anything up here the Giants news and football news in general has been really, really dry for the past couple of weeks, you know? And it's it's expected. There's still a lot of stuff waiting on government officials to give them the OK. Um, it's promising because basketball players are back at their facilities. Uh, they just started uh, soccer over in Europe. Um, I mean, I'm getting so into wanting live sports that I was excited to see that they started the women's soccer league in two weeks. Oh, uh, man. But I, I mean, mean I, so was so, I was so craving for live sports that I actually watched golf. You know, the, you know of course, it was entertaining. The match uh, with Brady, Woods, Peyton, and um, Phil Mickelson, of course, it was yep. bound to be entertaining. But I'll be honest with you, had it not been for the pandemic, I don't care who was playing, I would not have been watching golf. <laughs> I don't I don't mind golf. Golf's okay to throw on when you're doing other stuff. It's like a good barbecue sport to have in yeah. the background when people are overeating because you don't need to pay attention until the final couple holes and the sport is unbelievably slow and boring to watch for more than like a half hour. Now some oh, people I agree like with you. I, I call it a cleaning sport because I put it if I do put it on it would be like like what you say I, when I'm cleaning, I'm vacuuming and I just need noise in the background. Yeah, and it sometimes it's it's fun. Like uh, Brady, I watched the highlight. Brady made some a really nice chip, and can be exciting to watch those. Um, and he ripped his pants, which is always great. Anytime yeah. Brady can <laughs> screw up. <laughs> he had a, he had like a little feud going on with uh, Charles Barkley, who was on commentary. And I don't know, Barkley said something about Brady couldn't make a shot, and then he hits uh, what I assume was a really good one, had pretty good distance on it, and it was pretty accurate. Yeah. So, I mean, that was pretty entertaining, too. I I, I like uh, Charles as a commentator. Um, obviously, 90% of what comes out of his mouth is bullshit, but... It's he's entertaining. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, he's definitely entertaining. I would love to have a little... I, I wouldn't want, like, an entire panel of, you know, Chucks on the football side of things, but I would love to have a little bit more football commentary that's similar to what Charles Barkley does with the NBA. Because part of what makes... But watching basketball really fun is when you got guys like him cracking jokes and talking nonsense a little bit. Yeah, definitely. He definitely makes things more interesting. Um, like you said, you can't have a whole panel of him because then you're not actually getting that insight you want. And it can sometimes take away. But having him to 
crack jokes, break the tension, and sometimes people take sports a little too seriously. So having somebody in there that's like, hey, it's still a game. It's still a sport, you know, is fun. And you know what this just brought up into my mind, literally just popped into my mind. So Eli Manning got a Twitter over the past week, right? And I'll be honest with you, Eli's Twitter has been the most entertaining thing for me in quarantine so far. (laughs) And I, everything he tweets is either really funny or or is just like a really good tweet. And, you know, I, I, I I call him the goat of Twitter when he was only one day old on Twitter. Cause, and there's like a meme going around, you know, saying that Eli can't miss every tweet that he tweets is, you know, it's like a three point shot going in the basket. He just can't (laughs) miss. And like, it's been really entertaining and it's, I like it because it's showing a lot of fans what players have been saying for years that he's actually a really fun and funny guy to be around. You just don't see it because, you know, he he says what's needed when talking to the press. But we don't see the other side of Eli, which is kind of coming out on Twitter a little bit. Oh, I, I loved him going back and forth with like Barkley, going back and forth with Brady. Um, it is. He's he is. Uh, I've heard he's a funny guy. And, you know, as a Giants fan, you catch glimpses of it. But, yeah, his Twitter has been has been pretty spot on. Yeah. And us as Giants fans, we kind of knew before it's, you know, it's not in the forefront of our minds, but we've had exposures to funny Eli, like in his commercials. Oh, Eli's commercials are just always just really good to watch and funny, man. You ever seen his SNL? I, I uh, when he hosted SNL after um the Super Bowl or was yeah. it like before the Super Bowl or something like that? It was after they won the first Super Bowl. I saw it. Yeah. Uh, anybody who hasn't seen it needs to go watch it right now. It's up on YouTube somewhere. One of the greatest SNL episodes ever, and that's completely my bias talking, but it was an amazing SNL episode. The uh, the little brother skit is great, where he goes and he helps younger brothers beat their older brothers in yeah. sports. And he ties up one of the kids and throws him in his trunk. And he's like, <laughs> screw you, Peyton. And the guy's like, that's that's not his name. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's another thing, right? Speaking about, you know, the brother and, and Peyton thing, the, the best commercials with Eli is when he does it with Peyton. And my favorite oh. one of all time is when they went to the ESPN headquarters and they're like shoving each other and fighting each other behind their dad. That's, that's a good one. That is a good one. And uh, speaking of that, the dry news but i think we can maybe segue a little uh i know you said you didn't want to overly um saturate the daniel jones but i did want to just touch on it real quick yeah for sure it sounds like jones has really been living in the film he's working down with his duke coach and his qb coach and it's just all positive things coming from him and That's good because you don't always hear positive things. I like to hear no news or good news. So it doesn't sound like he's letting the New York lifestyle get to him. He's not pulling the Baker Mayfield, doing a bunch of commercials or, you know, some of these other guys. Johnny Manziel comes to mind. Um, RG3, though he had injuries. But some of these guys that take that celebrity status after only one or two years of doing it. So I I was happy to hear that. It keeps me positive. That right there was exactly what you said. I had from my guys, from my Giants guys, I want to hear either no news or good news. And sometimes no news is the best news, to be honest with you. And it's like, I I heard about it. I'll admit, I didn't really look into it because like you said, I don't want to really oversatch anybody on the Daniel Jones stuff. For anybody that's been watching my channel like the past month or so, anytime I've had the chance to talk about Jones, I've essentially been saying the same thing, which is I expect him to take a leap forward uh, for two main reasons. One being that quarterbacks the past five years and their second year seem to always take a leap forward. It's the way they're kind of built in college now where their rookie year, they really experiment because nobody sits anymore. And it's not, and part of that is because they don't need to sit anymore. The quarterbacks come in and they're like really extremely prepared, especially a Daniel Jones who had Cutcliffe as his head coach, one of the greatest quarterback, you know, whisperers of all time, you know, with Peyton and Eli and now DJ looking to follow in both of their footsteps. He was extremely prepared coming in, so I expect him to take that second step. And of course, the team, the immediate team around him is extremely improved looking at the offensive line. And like you said, now he's just he's just been a, a film head over the offseason thus far. Like he hasn't had a chance to go in and do any type of physical work with the team, but he's completely making that up by just 
literally throwing himself into his film on not even his film throwing himself into football film in general trying to get better and smarter with it and that would be my my biggest knock on daniel jones last year can you hear that by the way my dog i i, I can it's it's right, not just, it's not extremely loud but i can hear it i'm gonna take it away she's she's going crazy on a toy just a sec there all right that should that should I, change that. I, she looks like she's having fun though. I can't lie to you. <laughs> you probably oh, might sure need to water after this. Uh, so what I was gonna say is, um, my big knock on Daniel Jones last year was he had a little bit poor pocket awareness. He could read. I, I wouldn't defense. say a little bit. I would say a lot of it poor pocket awareness. So so film watching is going to help that a lot, um, and hopefully an improved offensive line because that's. His pocket awareness is really what kept him from taking the next step last year. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's um, it's and that was part of the reason that kind of helped the offensive line get worse. If that makes any sense, uh, like because the offensive line when Eli was in there for the first two weeks, and this is another thing I bring up a lot was it was top ten in the NFL in both running stats and passing protection. Um, Eli steps out, Daniel Jones steps in, and all of a sudden the offensive line is not performing as well as it was before. Part of that I completely believe is because it just was not a good offensive line and maybe they had flashes in those first two games. But the more logical side of me says it's definitely because you replaced a very experienced veteran quarterback who knows how to handle himself in a pocket and read pocket presence and read pressures. You're replacing him with a rookie who doesn't know how to do that yet. And so that definitely helped with the offensive line's performance kind of going down the drain. And, yeah, the only way you can do that is by just knowing pressure is better, knowing how to be better in, in your pocket with film and everything else. Yeah, and um, that's, a, that's a very good point. I didn't know they were that good in the beginning. Um, like I said last time when we were talking, their interior line is very strong. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the tackles. And I know that Nate Soldier had some – uh, personal issues at the end of last year. So maybe that's twofold. Um, Daniel Jones struggling a little bit to understand um, everything going on around him and Nate Soldier having some personal issues, not being completely there. Uh, but that's, that's interesting. So that makes me more more excited for this year to hear that they were that strong at the beginning of the season. And I mean, I knew they yeah, were, they were, um, they were really good. And I, uh, my bad for interrupting, but I, I tried to actually find those stats again, but I, I couldn't, right. Cause what I, what I did say, like, I think it was week four. I just literally went on Google. And I'm like, the offensive line has been pretty good thus far in the year. Uh, with the exception, you know, since Daniel Jones stepped in, I noticed a dip. I was like, how good are they really? And I went on PFF and I was like looking at, uh, you know, how they ranked their, you know, best offensive line by pass protection, by run protection. And they did it on a week by week basis. And unless you have like the paid PFF version, you can't see that anymore. You just say like the overall yearly performance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But at the time, since they were doing it week by week and anybody could have seen it, the Giants for the first three or four weeks uh, in pass protection, they were top 10. And then in run blocking, they were top five. So they were really good. Those like the first month of the season. Yeah, and that that's that's very positive to hear. Um, I mean, I, obviously, watching the games, I knew they were improved, but I didn't know it was it was that much. Um, wow! So so, so Daniel, yeah, Jones, Daniel Jones still trending upward. <laughs> it, there's nothing but good things coming from him there. And then I mean, kind of off topic, but you know, it's still connected. Another reason I think the offensive line went down is because the coaching just over the year, did, you know, went down also. You know, so yeah. uh, that brings brings even that, more yeah. exciting towards Daniel Jones side and the fact that we have a bunch of new coaches on the team that this year I right now I want to say they're already better than our coaching staff last year, but won't be determined until we see the product on the field. But I'm very confident in this coaching staff that we have, you know, both on the offensive side and defensive side. Yeah, no, I, I am. Um, I was listening to how often our defensive coordinator blitzed when he was with the Dolphins. So hopefully, um, because our defense is going to have to gamble a little bit because I don't think we've got as much talent, uh, hopefully those pay off and he can dial up some good blitzes 
you know, Steve Spagnola. That's what I always think about when I hear a, def- a blitzing defensive coordinator. I'm like, oh, maybe we can uh, find another Steve Spagnola because he was he was amazing defensive coordinator for us for a Steve while. Steve Spagnola there. was really good defensive coordinator, but one thing I noticed is that you got to have talent on the team for his defense to work. And I don't yeah. think maybe we have talent, you know, enough talent now for it to work. And I would like to have Steve Spagnuolo back, honestly. I mean, obviously, dude just won a Super Bowl with the Chiefs. And the Chiefs defense last year compared to this year, it's like night and day. It's not like they're a top defense in the league or anything, but good enough to win you a Super Bowl, which is honestly all you need. Um, I would love to have Spagnuolo back on. But the one the one knock I can have on him is that he can't run his defense without you know sufficient talent on the team. I, you know, I think that's true. I think the knock that's been on him, that makes a lot of sense. And you saw it when he tried to be a head coach and stuff like that. Um, he's very good at what he does and he's good at drawing up blitzes and he's good at being a defensive coordinator, but he does need his players. Um, he reminds me a level. lot of almost like a college coach. If he can go out and recruit the type of players that fit his system, he's very good. Um, but he's not like, like the difference between like a, uh, who's the coach over there for the Rams? Sean, uh, Sean McVay, no, Sean McVay compared to like a Bill Belichick. Sean McVay is great with his players that fit into his system. That's Steve Spagnola and Bill Belichick can take any player and build a system around him. Mm-hmm. That's the difference. Exactly. And then um, speaking on this whole college thing, since Daniel Jones is going back to college, well, an interesting article I found, uh, I think it was yesterday. I can't even remember. Time has been a blur for me in quarantine. But um, Saquon Barkley was apparently going to go back to Penn State as yeah, an assistant coach before the coronavirus shutdown. And not like an early retirement type thing, Giants fans, so don't panic. But <laughs> he was going to go back to Penn State. Um, with James Franklin, I think, is the head coach of Penn State. And whoever the head coach is, Saquon has a really, really good relationship with them, you know, going back to when they were recruiting Saquon in high school. And he was going back there to help improve his play on the Giants because, you know, Penn State, spring football, you know, spring training and all that. He wants to go back and see how to improve himself in the film room, kind of like what Jones is doing at Duke. Um, he was going to help make game plans as an assistant coach, which is only going to help your football IQ and all that. And I just found out it's super interesting when I saw it. It's um, That's another thing that's positive. Anytime you hear a player trying to come up with an interesting way to learn, because, you know, once you get to the NFL, once you get to that level, all these guys are freak athletes, tremendous athletes. So you've got to find a way to differentiate yourself. And if he's learning – by going back and working with his college coaches, watching film, teaching other running backs, how to be a little bit more patient, how to find holes a little bit better. Um, those are great because he's got all the skills. He doesn't need to get stronger. He doesn't need to get faster. He doesn't need better hands. <laughs> he's got all that. Yeah. No, in spades. So, like, yeah, if there's one thing he needs to improve upon, I guess it would be, you know, the football IQ side of things, and he's already a pretty damn smart player. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But um, that's the one thing you can always improve on, I th- feel like, is football IQ. You still see, you know, Peyton Manning until he retired, Tom Brady all the time, Eli Manning until he, he was gone. These great, uh, great quarterbacks live in film room all through their career because you can always improve. You improve can always grow. Back. Yeah. Exactly. And you brought up a really good point with him teaching players. And this is kind of a life thing, right? You know, I'm in college and whenever I have trouble with a topic and I go for help with it, you know, from a tutor, I I know to myself that if I can't teach it back to somebody that I don't completely understand it. So Mm -hmm. for him to go to teach what he does to, you know, other players and running backs, uh, he it means to himself that he knows he completely understands what he's doing and he's super confident in it to bring it to the Giants. That's that's true. If you can explain it to somebody else, then you have a very good knowledge. And uh, I wanted to play off that. You mentioned smart players and being able to teach. Um, I was listening to Bad Dog Sports and The Entertainer. They were talking about the Giants um, today. They did a live uh, stream, I think, yesterday or the day before. And just how 
the big thing, and you had been talking about this too, the big thing they keep saying is the Giants drafted smart players. Um, and they pointed to Darnell Holmes as like the big steal of the draft. Both Rob Woodson and Deion Sanders said they wouldn't be shocked if five years from now, everyone's looking back and saying he was the best corner of this year's draft. I And I agree with you. I don't like... I usually don't like to toot my own horn because it makes me seem like a jackass. But I've I've been saying Darnell Holmes is one of these guys we need to look out for. And did you watch the round table, by the way? Uh, the Giants round table? I don't think so. Uh, it's um so it's basically and we're I'm not sure how often we plan to have it, but there's been two episodes so far. The last episode covered, you know, kind of like recap of the draft and whatnot. It's like me. Uh, Kid Blue, OGR, Bad Dog, Entertainer, Rover Sports, and last time Cop Pizzle, we all get on on a, just basically a giant collab, a round table, and talk Giants. And we were um, in that stream, and even before that on the channel, I've said, I'm excited for Darnay Holmes, but I don't know how excited I should be uh, in the fact that I think he was the smartest player in the draft. Like you said, you got former players saying, don't be surprised if he was like, the best corner you know years down from now we got uh you know these draft scouts saying that he was possibly the smartest player in the draft on and off the field the guy finished college like one and a half years early uh you know plays chess for like he picked up chess for fun because he saw them playing it in the locker room and he's just like let me try that and now he does like a chess whiz or something and then his athletic ability being one of the faster player in the drafts also you combine those two things great intelligence and smarts with a great athletic ability usually it spells out only good things for a player in the nfl and that that's why i'm like i'm not sure how excited i should be on one hand i really think this guy could be our starting slot corner uh come this fall i really think he could beat out of julian love there's a chance that might happen on the other hand i'm like he dropped and sometimes you know you get this you get steals in the draft sometimes players drop and they shouldn't drop but on the you know most of the times they drop because there's a reason they drop most of the times they fall where they're supposed to fall. And I'm not sure where to where to place my bet here. I so I think that we got to steal. I like former players when former players come out on somebody. They, they've played the game. They know what to look for. Um, it always it's always a positive in my mind. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. You know, I think part of the problem is he's playing out in California where you got the delay people aren't staying up to watch as much and they the Pac-12 hasn't been strong in recent years like in the past people were staying up to watch because USC was dominant and Oregon had the Chip Kelly offense and they were exciting good teams that they just haven't been so maybe he slipped through the scouts a little bit being out there on the west coast in a, in a weaker division mm-hmm. not going up against the talent that you're seeing in the, you know, the Big Ten and the uh, SEC. Um, just, you know, he's not facing the elite level talent out there in the Pac-12. Another reason that just popped into my mind again is that I know he was injured his 2019 season. And so anytime, you know, people that actually know a lot about homes, like a lot of my viewers have uh, said that, you should check out his 2018 tape as opposed to his 2019 tape because he was fully healthy in 2018 and that was his best season. And the reason he kind of took a step back or he wasn't as noticeable in 2019 was because he was playing hampered. So, I mean, that's probably another reason, you know, he probably fell off some scouts uh, book or something like that. And, you know, I come back to you hear something like that and I'm like, scouts, they have their job is is very tough. Mm-hmm. And lots of times scouts and GMs will take, and I'll, I'll bring it back to fancy because you said you wanted to do, someone was just debating with me, like near the end of the draft, do I take an Adrian Peterson or a rookie? And I'm like, well, take Adrian Peterson. He's a known. Yeah. You know, and he's going that late and he wasn't that bad last year. So maybe a lot of these scouts are sitting there in the second round like, all right, we got a corner that played all last year. We know he's not going to be great, but we know he's going to be good and we can plug him in and start him right away. Or we got Darnay Holmes who was injured last year. He's got higher potential, but he's that like that unknown. So they're like, and then there's the injury risk. 
Yeah, like I'll just like I'll go the with the known. Yeah, yeah, I'll go with the known, and I can understand that. I do that a lot in fantasy. I go with the known um, over the risk, so that that makes a lot of sense. That there might have been some question marks about the caliber of talent out in the Pac-12 and the fact that he missed some games, and they're like, I'll take a guy who's ceiling might be a little bit lower but i know what i'm getting i i that's a great point you brought up there with the comparison to fantasy football and what might have happened in you know the gm room for many of these teams that's definitely probably what happened and the thing is with me it's like my biggest concern with holmes is like not if he's gonna not reach his ceiling my biggest concern is re-injury risk because we already have like the Giants and, and injury history the past like three, four years has just been nasty and I don't want that to continue. And we already got a cornerback who's not reaching his full potential because of injuries in Sam Beal. So it's like, that's my biggest concern with Holmes. I just hope he could stay healthy. And then I, I think if he does stay healthy, he's going to be a starting caliber and probably even more so cornerback. So, so this is completely off topic, but I just got some good news. Uh, I got a text from a good friend of mine who is a Bills ticket, um, season ticket holder. And he got a call from his ticket rep today. Uh, they are expecting to have fans in some capacity. It looks like instead of eight home games, he can get two because they're gonna be doing something like quarter, um, filling the stadium with a quarter of the amount of people that they usually do. Um, they might be banning tailgating, which stinks and they might have a guy counting how many people are going up for concessions. So there's not too many people going up for concessions at one point, but it does look like they are going to be putting, at this point, fans in the stadiums, at least in Buffalo, at about 25% capacity. Well, thank God for that, Jesus. <laughs> I would I would have been really sad, I'm going to tell you, if I couldn't go to a Giants game this year. Like, I tried to make it to one game every year, um, and... I, that's 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 really good to hear at least you know on the bill side of things hopefully there's something similar is happening across the league yeah I'd, I'd assume that is because i i can't see the owners allowing some stadiums to have fans and make that money and the other owners to not and take that hit like it's just not fair yeah it's not and, fair. Uh, and the, the the thing i do kind of find a weirdo is that they're filling up a quarter of the stadium for me, right, and and I might be going a little too radical on this since it's a whole pandemic situation. Um, why why fill a quarter? Why not just? You see, this is where it gets kind of not not even political, but just kind of um divisive on the channel, which I know my viewers don't particularly like, but I want to get it out there. It's uh, if there's such a great risk that you could only fill up a quarter of the stadium, why not just keep it at an empty stadium? You know, why not just eliminate the risk? I feel like if it was completely safe, they'd probably have maybe a full stadium or, you know, a little bit more than a quarter. Like a quarter of a stadium is a very, very big reduction. I, I think it comes down to the, uh, the almighty dollar. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's you got a, a point there. It's NFL a big, hates to lose money. It's a big hit. And I know a lot of these owners... Um, and a lot of these leagues have come out and they said they're going to pay the concession stand people and the security guards whether or not they're there. Um, I know Mark Cuban paid every single one of his employees full salary the whole time the NBA has been out. So I think it's kind of like a we number one, some of these people, some of it is greed some of these owners are super greedy and they want that money and some of it is you're employing a lot of people mm -hmm. to have none of them be able to come in because you're having no fans it it's an economic hit especially if like you know some of these people let's say they probably have a job and then probably part-time they're picking up sundays for only the football season going and selling concessions and now all of a sudden it's like hey that money you're using so that you can go on vacation or you can cover your car payment, you're not going to get this year. Um, so I try not to look at it solely as a greedy standpoint, just because I do know some, I have some friends who have been laid off. So yeah. them wanting to get back to work and wanting things to open up is not coming from greed. It's coming from necessity. That's a great point. Yeah. I I'll admit 
it, it did slip my mind the fact that these dudes they do have employees but and maybe we should kind of divert from here because what i would say is do what mark cuban does you know these guys are billion dollar you know companies they can afford to pay their employees through whether they're there or not and maybe maybe i'm wrong about that i don't know what I, type of necessities you know the owners have that they have to take care of regardless of where people show up or not but i don't know that's, i agree with you to a point and that's why i said part of it is greed and i don't want to get that that's as far as i'm gonna go i don't want to get too political yeah. because I, I do and you know and people have different stands and different reasoning and i i don't know enough to sit here and exactly. judge some of these guys but yeah. it is it is very honorable what mark cuban did um he definitely has the money he's and cuban like has been billions. like throughout his career as that basketball owner he's been like i don't want to say cool but he's been one of those more um just not normal uh owners you know he's just been one of the guys that are kind of a little bit more in tune with his crowd and audience he's been oh. Yeah, I've I've always liked Cuban. He's a he's a smart, um, self-made, like in tune, in touch guy. Exactly. Um, and I don't feel like he, when he talks, not always because sometimes he runs his mouth a little bit, but usually when he talks, it it comes across as well educated. Like he's he's thought on what he's saying. Yeah, and yo, know, do you ever watch Shark Tank? I love Shark Tank. I do. Oh, my God. Shark Tank is one of my favorite shows of all time. Before I knew Cuban was the owner of the Mavericks, I just knew him as that guy on Shark Tank. I, I'm a big fan of Shark Tank. Um, it's it's fun. I, I studied business in school. Um, I work for a marketing company. So I'm always watching those things and like thinking like, hey, can can this guy be marketed? Like, how would you market something like this? Is this really? So it, I find it interesting personally. Yeah. Now, Shark Tank um, is just an entertaining show, man. Like, yeah. And like, there's been a couple of products on there that, like, um, that uh, that really they missed out on. Like, um, for example, you know, the Ring Doorbell, right? The Ring Doorbell appeared on Shark Tank. It was like under a different name or something at the time, and I don't think anybody, you know, anybody actually bought into it, and they left, and they still became a success. So sometimes it's because. I've heard people go on there, and then they they don't really want to sell. They just want to get that marketing bump, that exposure. So they're they're like they come on um i forget there was a dating app that went on that's doing pretty well where uh the two women wanted like 50 million dollars for 10 percent of an app that had made like 20 million dollars in the three years before like mm -hmm. they weren't they weren't they weren't trying to sell but then all of a sudden the next year they made like 35 million <laughs> and yeah. it was like they wanted the free marketing they came on they had a very good smart business plan and but they were asking for money that no one was going to pay. Like it, it was a business valued at 20 million. And they're like, hey, if you give us more than what this is worth, we'll give you 10 percent of that company. <laughs> exactly, man. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely have that feeling with a couple of the, of the uh, people that I've seen on there, man. It's a great show for any of you listening out there. If you haven't checked it out, you might be thinking, I don't want to really watch a show about people pitching their products and then, you know, business jargon and whatnot. I'm not a very much a business dude, but it's just entertaining as hell. I mean, it has to be to be like how many seasons they got and it shows on ABC. It's not exactly like ABC is a business channel or anything, but Shark Tank has been going strong for almost 10 years now. It's a really entertaining show. Yeah, it's it's a very good show. Uh, it's in it, it. It's it's been multiple seasons for sure. Uh, but let's one last let's thing. I want to get back to, to the Giants. <laughs> yeah. Uh, DeAndre Baker, good news. It sounds like he either didn't do it or it's been exaggerated. So we're he's been cleared to practice, um, and he's been released on bail. So those are are very good things. Uh, oh, I didn't know he was cleared to practice. I knew he was released on bail. And that the Giants contacted him. Basically, they said, you know, finish out the legal stuff because we don't know how long that's going to take. They suggested that he doesn't attend any virtual meetings because it would be too much of a distraction, both for the team and for himself, you know, distracting him away from finishing up the legal stuff. I did not know he was cleared for practice, though. Yeah, two days ago, he was he's allowed to travel. He's allowed to go to um, things for working purposes and the Giants um, aren't banning him from the facility. So yeah that's that's good um like i talked to you about that the bad side is the commissioner of the nfl's name is roger goodell and if you 
are at the wrong place at the wrong time, you're going to get at least a two game suspension. So we, we know DeAndre Baker's missing at least a couple of games, even if it turns out he didn't do this. Yeah. Uh, just because it he, he clearly was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I mean, he, he was doing illegal gambling. Yeah. Without getting too much into it, I'm not going to say DeAndre is innocent, even though I want him to be for obvious reasons pertaining to the Giants and, you know, pertaining to the fact that I don't want him to throw his entire life away because if he isn't innocent, he's going to jail for a long time. Uh, I think he's going to be not guilty at the very least. Like there's so much evidence in, in his favor and his lawyer is doing a really good job at this building, really a wall of evidence that suggests DeAndre is like innocent of all crimes. You got so many witnesses coming forward saying he didn't do it. There's a video with a timestamp that basically says DeAndre left the party. And then it wasn't until two hours later that a phone call to the cops was made. You know, there's, there's just like so much stuff in his favor. That I think he's going to get off as not guilty. But I agree with you, man. Uh, Goodell has been a very hard commissioner when it comes to anything dealing with the law. But in recent years, he has kind of lightened up. I'm not sure if that I'm not saying he's not going to suspend DeAndre, but he has kind of lightened up from what he was. He's lightened up in the appeals process. He's letting people appeal and he's like lowering it. But I feel like he still suspends you initially. Yeah. And even if he doesn't suspend DeAndre, I don't even know if, if Baker is going to have that starting job come fall. Not this is not talking talent wise or anything. It's just that he's already missed so much time getting used to his new coaches and getting to know the playbook. Like he's missing quite a bit of time. And oh, yeah. I don't think he's going to be the starter week one. He's going to be the starter eventually again. But it's going to take time to make up for the, what he lost. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and just just looking at that, I, you know, that's why we're hoping Holmes turns out to be what uh, Rob Woodson and uh, Deion Sanders said he said they think he can be. <laughs> that exactly. way we don't miss a beat. And then when Baker comes in, we uh, we move some pieces around. And like I was saying, we had got a lot of corners hoping one would stick we find out which which one stick and maybe we trade it trade the other for uh some draft capital next year because we still have sadly a decent amount of uh holes on our defense yeah i mean the the secondary right now went from the weakest part to the part with the most potential mm -hmm. i think it's definitely improved but uh, i think people are underrating how much Baker actually means to the secondary. Yeah, he didn't perform well his rookie year. He was lackluster. But the dude has a higher floor than anybody else there not named James Bradbury. You know, in the cornerback room as of right now, he has a higher floor and potentially yeah. even a higher ceiling. And he's our number two corner. Like, you take him away, you have to shift around a lot of parts. And it is a big hit to what was a, a you know, a nicely improved secondary. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Anytime you lose a starter you know, that you use the first round pick on it it's a huge and trade it up for <laughs> yes and tr yeah traded back into the first round to get so you know that the giants really wanted him um i i had one more quick note i don't know if you had anything else uh benjamin victor i've been hearing a lot of chatter about him have you heard much chatter i mean undrafted free agent but some people are saying uh, they're surprised he wasn't drafted and he might might have been a decent steal uh, at receiver. Um, I don't know how he'd fit our system based on his size. He looks more like a slot guy. But have you heard much about him? Uh, I heard much about him, Dan. You might as well call me Nostradamus because about three <laughs> months ago, I had the Giants taking him in the sixth round and I wanted the Giants to take him in the sixth round in one of my mock drafts because I uh, the chatter you're hearing now, bro, I'm taking full credit for it. What everybody's saying is what I've been saying for three months. This dude, and he should have been drafted, by the way. He should have been drafted. He's definitely, like, where I was unsure whether or not uh, Darnay Holmes fell to where he belonged or whether or not he was a steal. I'm completely sure that Benjamin Victor is a steal. He should have been somebody that went in the fifth or sixth round, a really underutilized wide receiver at Ohio State. Not that I could blame you know, the uh, Ohio State coaching staff, they always have a really good and deep wide receiver core there. But he was somebody that was underutilized throughout all his years there. And when he um, he never got the chance to sort of have that breakout year because he never had that many targets. I think the most amount of targets and don't don't quote me on this, but an estimate 
the most amount of targets Darnay Holmes, not Darnay Holmes, uh, Benjamin Victor had at Ohio State was like around 180 to 200 in an entire season, which uh, is not that much for a receiver that you want him to have like a, a thousand yard season or something. And his size is something that I love in terms of height, but he definitely needs to improve in the weight category. Yeah, I'm worried about skinny. him. Yeah, I'm worried about him getting injured because he's like six five or six six four six five around there. But he's only like 190, and I want him to be like 210 at least. Not sure um, if he could build up to that given the current situation, but if he could build up to at least 200, 205, I'll be a lot more confident in him. But Victor is somebody that should have went, should have been drafted. He played with a great program at Ohio State. Uh, by all means, he was underutilized, and I think if he was used more, he would have probably been like a third round pick or something. I have high hopes for him, and I expect him to make the team as an undrafted free agent. Yeah, well, all right. Well, I guess it was good that I asked you about him real quick um, because it sounds like you are the reason the other YouTubers <laughs> are talking about him. Dan said that kind of covers it. I mean, I think it was a pretty good episode given the situation of Dry News Weekly. I mean, we we got into, you know, the Mark Cuban and Shark Tank. We got into coronavirus situation, some good news with the bills that would hopefully spread to the rest of the NFL. It was a pretty good episode considering the circumstances. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm uh, always happy to come on. I can't wait to have you on in our couple weeks. And uh, I like that we got a name for it. So Yeah, the Fantastic Giants is going places, guys. Get ready. <laughs> it is. Stay strapped in. <laughs> but uh, yeah, once again, make sure you check out Dan uh, with Five Wide Football. Their YouTube channel over there will be in the description. Their blog will be in the description. And of course, their Twitter page, which honestly is probably uh, the best part about Five Wide Football. They always put out some tweet that's going to keep you thinking or entertained, like at least at the very, very least, like once a day. So make sure you check these guys out. Well, thank you for that. And obviously, if you're here, you probably already are checking out um the hub in uh kush but he's got he's on top of it he's ahead of most of even the other giant youtube bloggers really good quality he knows what he's talking about he puts in the time i love talking to him because anything i missed about the giants he's going to point out to me <laughs> any news that i hadn't heard about he's he's heard about so oh, thank you about that man you're the fantasy guru and uh, I guess you could say, I guess I'm the Giants guru. We got two gurus on here. I don't know why you're listening to any other. Dan, why are they listening to another sports podcast, man? You got to tell me. I don't get it. Maybe we're not putting out enough content. We got we to put out <laughs> more content. So we gotta... you know, they, they, they listen to all of ours, then they move on to someone else. <laughs> uh, maybe. Maybe we just got to be uh, working harder. Who knows? But, um, yeah, once again, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, like, share, subscribe, and we're out. Alright guys, thanks for watching, put your comments down below, make sure you smash that like button, subscribe and turn on post notifications. Until next time, I'm out. Yer.